God. Can you just say, God, thank you for your faithfulness. God, thank you for the stories I have to tell. God is displaying his greatness all around us, all among us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. To him be the glory. We're going to open up God's word in just a minute. We're going to talk about God the Holy Spirit. And uh, so you guys go ahead and take a seat. Open your Bibles, open your mobile devices, whatever you need. I want to welcome everybody here. This morning at Encounter Church, our family, our friends, our guests. Guests, if you're here and you haven't been through our VIP journey called Encounter Connect, all roads lead through Encounter Connect here at Encounter Church. It's our VIP welcome, and it is fantastic. You'll, uh, you'll have a lot of laughs, great food, and most of, all, most of all, you'll make a few friends right out of the gate as you get to know people here at Encounter Church. We want to welcome all of our online um, partners and uh, members all over the world. And we say it's good to have you with us today as well. Whew. Tell you what, you know, God is omnipresent. That means He's everywhere all the time, okay? But there are times where He manifests His presence, and today is one of them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Where He reminds you, He kind of taps you on the shoulder just to remind you how real He is we're going to dive right in. We're in week two of Leave or Cleave, and I want to preface what I'm going to say today. What we're going to talk about is um, what I believe is the foundation for all relationships. Uh, for Whether it's your friend at work, your neighbor in the neighborhood, whether it's another student at school, or um, a friend on your job someplace, a fellow employee uh, whether it's just your bowling buddies or your, you know, your um, banquet gals or whatever, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today, <laughs> we're going to talk about today is foundational for all relationships, all relationships. It is the most powerful way to live in those relationships. Okay, Amen. All right, let's jump right into Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 15 and 16 to begin with. Let's read this out loud together. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. So there's a difference, right? There's a comparison contrast. So he's getting that. Num uh, verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So be wise, not unwise. And he talks about this in the context of being careful how you live. So this is how we live our lives. So in other words, live as a wise person. If you're taking notes, this is the first fill in the blank. Live as a wise person. Don't just try to have wisdom when you need it. You know, when you're trying to, you got yourself in a spot and now I, I, gotta, I gotta have some wisdom to, to, to make a rescue here or something like that to get out of the situation and stuff, right? But try to put this on as a practice, living as a wise person. Now, now how do you do that? Well, he says in verse 16, by making the most of every opportunity. The most of every opportunity. And I want to tell you, this is in the context of relationships. So we're not talking about making the most of every opportunity in business, okay, so we can succeed in business. Although that's important. God blesses all that. But we're specifically talking about relationships. So it's making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. It's making sure that you tell your wife, your spouse, your husband, hey, I love you. Have you told them that yet today? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's telling your friends that, hey, man, I, I know we've been having a great weekend, but I just want to pause you. Man, I, I love and appreciate you, dude. Gal. I, it, it's, it's making sure that you take the opportunity, make the most of the opportunity to, to take some time to pray today, talk to God. Right? It's making sure that you take the opportunity, make the most of it. Those of you that have children, to hug your children. Tell me you love them. See, see it's, it's making the most of the opportunity of those things that matter with people and relationships because people are the only, pe only thing that's going to go to heaven with you. Nothing else is going, you know. My jet skis aren't going to heaven with me, okay? <laughs> right? I won't need them there, all right? So it's making the most of what matters and taking opportunity every day. It's taking the opportunity every day to share the love of God with someone. 
to tell them about the great things God has done in your life. It's, it's bringing someone into an atmosphere in the body of Christ like this so that they can be introduced to their creator, to the one who loves them more than anyone can ever imagine or even comprehend, introducing them to him, right? And so that they can have someone who will walk through life with them no matter what's going on in their life. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The Bible says in Hebrews that God puts an impossibility on himself. God limits himself. And he says for the believer, I will never leave you or forsake you. Thus saith the Lord. This is the God, this is the Jesus in the Bible who loves you so much. And, and he has some ways to do relationship that will just absolutely cause them to flourish. So let's take a look. How? Do you live as a wise person by making the most of every opportunity? Why? Because the days are evil. And I don't think I need to unpack that very much. Okay, But I will say this. There is coming a day, the Bible teaches, that the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is going to be removed from this world. And you think it's getting bad now. Whew, you haven't seen anything yet. Okay, It's not a time that anybody wants to be there. And so the time is short. The days are becoming more and more evil. And so we got to make the most of every opportunity, especially about bringing people to Jesus. As much as, as much as we can, as much as we know how to do that, to step out courageously and share what God's doing in your life. And maybe that will open up the door for a conversation about the Lord. And if not, just bring them. Bring them. We'll tell the stories of, of God's greatness every Sunday here. You know? And they'll hear those things and say, hey, maybe this God, maybe this God is real. You know? And, and even if someone doesn't give their life to Christ right out of the gate, that's okay. It may be 20 years later. But we're laying the foundation for the Holy Spirit to continue to open their heart and their mind to Him. Okay? He's the greatest, the greatest thing that's ever happened to us in our lives is Jesus. So why? Because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore, talking about how we live, being wise on how we live, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So, so he builds all the way to this phrase that, that he wants us to understand what God's will is. Now, God's will is not necessarily hiding someplace, okay? But sometimes it, it doesn't necessarily appear right in front of us. We don't know what the next step needs to be. And I think the biggest reason is because walking in God's ways and in His will, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Okay? It, it can be very challenging to go against all the current, go against all the wind of the culture. Okay? It, it can be very challenging to, to stand in a loving fashion to people in your own family that don't believe and are never going to, in our minds, live in God's ways. It's very challenging. So we're going to unpack what is God's will for you, for me today. It becomes very clear before we get there. So to be wise, you must understand what the Lord's will is. So what is God's will? We're going to keep reading here. And I want to preface this next verse. We are not going to talk about drunkenness or alcohol. That's not what we're talking about. See, please remove that from your mind. I want to read this with you, though, okay? And I'm going to explain it. Go to the next, ver the next slide, please. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This is an illustration to compare and contrast what God's will is. God's will is for you and me, believer, to be filled with God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, okay? He could use any kind of illustration, you know, oh, don't be filled with anger instead be filled with the Spirit. Don't, don't be filled with jealousy instead of be filled with the Spirit. Don't, don't be filled with anything that's going to control you other than God's Spirit. That's the illustration, you understand? So don't get hung up on what illustration that he gave, okay? It's all about making room for the influence and the power of God's Spirit to be that which fills you, not everything else, okay? So, Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And I want to kind of unpack this a little bit. Fill with the Spirit, that's, that's really 
that's Bible language, but it kind of gets maybe to some a little esoteric or it's out there, you can't grasp it, it's not as tangible as some other truth in God's Word. So I want to unpack some things very quickly as an overview. We talk about being filled with the Spirit. Um, when you believe in Jesus, that is the point that you are then saved from your sin. So when you come to the point in your life where you acknowledge that Jesus is God, Lord Jesus, you are God. And then you believe in your heart everything that God said that he did, he did. Jesus died on the cross. He was crucified. He was buried. Then he rose up from the grave for you, breaking hell wide open, defeating death, hell, and the grave, so that you know. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus is our first fruits of resurrection, meaning that you and I are going to be the second, third, fourth, fifth, and on. He shows us what's going to happen to us by breaking through the grave and resurrecting. So therefore, that's what's going to happen to you and me as well. We're going to have a resurrected body. Okay? So at salvation, it's the time when you believe. Now what happens when you believe? Well, first of all, you are completely, totally forgiven. Completely. All right? Now listen, th this is not 50% forgiven. Okay? J Jesus, when he hung on the cross, what did he say? It is Right? Just for practice, let's say it out loud. Ready? He said, it is finished, right? Okay? So we get all, in, all of us in, that, in our brain. It is finished. He didn't say 25% is finished, and hey, I'm going to forgive you the, the next 25% in about three years. No, no, no. God's work was completed on the cross. You have full forgiveness. It, it's not, the Bible doesn't teach, hey, guess what? God forgave you when you believed in him of all your past sins. But, but you got to deal with your present and, and the future. No. God has forgiven you of all sin, all shortcomings. All of it is completely forgiven forever. Amen? So when you, amen. So when you believed in him, you got complete forgiveness. Number two, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, took you and placed you in Christ into the body of Christ and his life surrounds you his perfect life so when God the Father our creator looks at us he no longer sees someone who comes up short all the time that's the definition of sin we can't hit the target hit the mark we fall short of the mark all the time and the mark is perfection that's why Jesus is God the perfect one who died for us. I, I'm not perfect. I couldn't die for you. I, I don't have that effect. But God came, fully God, fully man, died on the cross, and when we believe we're completely forgiven and the Holy Spirit places us in Christ, and then the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. Complete forgiveness, placed in Christ, the covering, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. You are baptized into the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, let's talk about baptism. That is a weird word, okay? Um, the Greek is actually baptizo. Kind of sounds like the English word baptize, right? Baptize, baptizo. That's because the word was not translated in your Bible. It was what we call transliterated. So when you transliterate a word, you bring the sound of it into the other language from Greek to English. The problem is it lost its meaning. So if you go to any Greek dictionary and you look up the word baptizo, you won't see to be baptized. You'll see to be immersed baptism means that you're immersed in the spirit of God okay so when you believe in Christ this, there's a lot more to it than this I'm being very simple when you believe in Christ you get full forgiveness forever you're placed in the body of Christ surrounded by him so that the father sees you as perfect from that moment on forever and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God immersed in his presence then the next step of obedience is water baptism water baptism and water baptism doesn't add anything to your salvation it's just a step of obedience it, it is a public picture of what already has taken place in your life when you believed and you were forgiven you were washed clean you're placed in the body and you were immersed in the spirit it's, it's a public picture professing to everyone publicly that I have been saved. And because I'm saved, because I believed, 
I'm now being baptized in water. It's a picture of already being baptized in the Holy Spirit, being placed in Christ. Does that make sense? Okay? So you're saved, completely forgiven, placed in Christ, and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then the step of obedience after that is to be water baptized. You know, celebrate that. If you've not taken that step, I want to encourage you. We will cheer you on. It's such an important step of obedience. And then after that, it's learning how to operate in your new relationship. And you do that by learning who God the Holy Spirit is. Learning who God the Holy Spirit is. With that said, I have been thinking for several weeks, how in the world can I illustrate this? Where they're going to remember it, right? This, this flow of the Holy Spirit that he's living in you and he's filling you and, and this, this fill the Holy Spirit stuff. A couple weeks ago, I kept hearing this sound in my house and kept waking me up and I was up at like 2 a.m. and I finally said, honey, I'm going to get up out of bed. I'm going to go ahead and fix that thing because it's driving me crazy. I can't get back to sleep. This is night after night after night. And so I got up and, and I know this is a little bit of a crude illustration, but I think you're going to remember it, Okay. And so I got up, and I went over to the hall bathroom, right? Okay? And I, I took open the tank, and I fixed the plunger, right? Because, because water kept coming into the tank, flowing in, right? And then it would go past the plunger, because the plant plunger wasn't stopping the water. It wasn't put down. The chain kept getting caught. It would hang the plunger up. It would flow right through into the bowl, and then out to water the earth, Right? It would just come into the tank, and it wouldn't get stagnant and stay in the tank because the flip, the flopper flipper thing was up, right? And it would go straight on through the bowl, and I kept hearing it running and running and running and running. Water just passing through and running through and passing through and running through. Well, the interesting thing is this. In Ephesians 5, 18, it says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. But we have that in English, be filled with the Spirit. That's not what it says in the Greek. It's two verbs there in the Greek. It's be kept being filled really strong be kept being filled constantly with the Holy Spirit and I thought this is it this is the illustration so now every time you go to the bathroom and you see a toilet hopefully you're going to think of the Holy Spirit right <laughs> I'm sorry it's crude but I think it's memorable All right. when your toilet runs all the time that is an illustration although a crude one of the Holy Spirit and what it means to be full of the Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit is flowing through you and not getting stagnant, but it's pouring out of you. It keeps being kept filled because it's flowing through you. Amen? Amen? All right, so think of the toilet. Think of the toilet. I want to give you another illustration. This one's out of Ezekiel chapter 47. So in Ezekiel chapter 40 is uh, where this angel takes the man of God, Ezekiel, the prophet. What appears to be, he takes him to what appears to be uh, the temple in heaven. God's throne room and all the room around it. Okay, the heavenly castle, if you will. And, and that is a type of what the Jews, the nation of Israel has built as the temple. Okay, that's their type here but the real thing is where Ezekiel's been taken, it appears to be. And so in chapter 40, this angel starts describing all the measurements and all the rooms in the temple in heaven. And then we come to chapter 47, verse 3 says, as the, man, as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep, Ezekiel says. Verse 4, then he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. And then he measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to my waist. And then he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because it was so powerful. Because the water had risen, was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. In verse 6, the angel asks Ezekiel, he asked me, son of man, do you see this? And I want to ask you that this morning. Do you see this? Are you connecting the dots together, little by little by little? Salvation, forgiveness, placed in Christ, 
baptized in the Holy Spirit, immersed. Water baptism. A picture of what had already happened in your life when you made the decision to believe in Christ. And then for the rest of your believing life, being filled and being filled, kept being filled and being filled and being kept being filled, be kept being filled, being filled and filled and filled. And so, Son of Man, do you see this? And then we skip to verse 9 at the end. It says, So where the river flows, everything will live. Wow. Most scholars believe that this picture in Ezekiel chapter 47 is a picture of the life-giving power of God the Holy Spirit. That the river is God the Holy Spirit. Four times the angel carefully measured that one, 1,000 cubits and, and kept leading Ezekiel further into the deeper waters. Ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. And then, and then it was over his head and he had to, had to swim and let it carry him because he couldn't cross it. It was power enough where he could not cross the, the river. It's almost as if he's, God's telling us that, hey, when you believe in Jesus, he's not going to throw you out into the deep, okay? So you can just flail and try to figure it all out. No, no, he's, he's going to bring you into the river ankle deep when you believe. So you can begin splashing around and getting to know God, the Holy Spirit. And then as you begin to grow in Christ, and we'll talk about that in a minute, it becomes knee deep. And then three, four, five years later, maybe waist, waist deep, and a few years later, you're swimming in the river, letting God, the Holy Spirit, the river of God, carry you about where he wants to take you. Amen? A river contains constant freshness because it's always flowing. Think of the toilet that's broken. A river never has the same water. Could it be that God's telling us that God has something new for us every single morning? This is the believer in partnership with God the Holy Spirit. That's what it's picturing. Because we're not to be sitting on the bank of the river just watching the waters flow by, admiring the works of the Lord and what He's doing. Instead, we're called to wade out into the water until we can no longer touch the bottom where we have to be then carried along by the river's lead and we have to learn to trust God no matter what happens. You think of it, in a, an astronaut's viewpoint, maybe. So let me ask you, can, can a man or a woman live on the moon? Well, the answer is both yes and no. No one can live on the moon if they go to the moon as they are. However, if they arrive on the moon wearing an appropriate, proper spacesuit, they can indeed live on the moon, at least for a while until their oxygen runs out, right? Because the spacesuit contains the same air that is found on the earth in the atmosphere. And by wearing the spacesuit, being covered and filled with the oxygen, the astronauts, astronauts can walk around, ride around, jump on the surface of the moon, all kinds of stuff. As a follower of Jesus, you must be filled with God's Spirit over and over and over again. Just like a spacesuit is filled with oxygen if you're to experience what God intends for every single one of you. This is how God has designed that you live as his son or daughter in Christ. So let me ask the next question. How can you live a life filled with God's spirit? How can you do that? I want to give three quick verses, and we're going to uh, put them all together so they make sense. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Let's read this one together. Here we go. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's what we've been talking about. You must understand what God's will is, right? It's process of renewing your mind. Well, what's he talking about? Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 now. Here Paul tells us, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So there's this, there's this process where you begin learning God's word and it begins to fill you up. It begins to dwell in you. It's such a measure that, that it's richly dwelling in you. It's filling you up. So we renew our mind through God's word. It ritually dwells in us. Let's go back to our main text now and we'll tie it all together. Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. 
This is God's will for us to be kept being filled to overflowing with God's Spirit. So let's put it all together. God's Word that richly dwells in you fills you up with all healthy attitudes and healthy ways to live, healthy decisions. It leads you because it's in you. God's Spirit then gives you the power to keep on living and keep on expressing these healthy attitudes, these healthy decisions of building your life, applying God's ways for living. That's the power of the Spirit in you. You put the Word in you, and the Spirit takes the Word and empowers you to do that which the Word has proclaimed. Hmm. Psalm 1-3 tells us that God wants all of us to be like trees planted by rivers of of water. So we're to be being kept filled with the Spirit of God. Which conversely means we're not supposed to be being filled with anything else. Okay? So so the picture is this life and how we live as wise, making the most of every opportunity so that we can have an incredibly full, rich, substantial life in relationships. So we're to be kept being filled with the Spirit, not with anything else. So let's get really, really practical, because I know this whole filling with the Spirit can be out there in in some sense. Let's get really practical. Um, When you are filled with God's Word and filled with God's Spirit, God's Spirit begins changing you. He has the power over time to really start changing your attitudes, your habits, all kinds of stuff, and how how you live in relationship. Uh, We're going to go through several slides real quickly here, and I want to give you an opportunity to help answer. There's going to be a first slide, and there's going to be a second slide with the answer on it. And I want you to think through each one of these with me and try to come up with the answer to the second slide as we get to the second slide, okay? Let me demonstrate the first one. So we're not supposed to be filled with anything else but God's Spirit, so we're no longer filled with anger, right? Man, I've had... Seasons of my life, I've been filled with anger. It wants to take me down and destroy me. So no no longer filled with anger, instead filled with healthy passion. Because anger is a form of passion. It's an unhealthy form of passion. Passion is great. So let's try, we're going to go pretty quick on this. No longer filled with jealousy, instead filled with appreciation and celebration. These are practical ways that when we're filled with the Spirit that God begins changing our attitudes and our ideas and our decisions. No longer filled with unforgiveness. Help me out here. Instead filled with what, church? Forgiveness. And what does forgiveness bring? Freedom. This is the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. No longer filled with bitterness. What do you think it is? Instead filled with joy and repentance. See, as we learn to operate being filled, kept being filled with the Spirit, we learn that along the day, we just confess along our day. And when we need to repent, we repent. So it doesn't build up and start weighing us down to where we have to carry all of that because we weren't meant to. Jesus has forgiven us. And we need to appropriate that which we already possess in Christ. And remember, there's no reason for blame in your life. There's no reason for you to feel shame. God's taking care of all that. So as we are filled with the Spirit, we're reminded of these things, right? No longer filled with bitterness, instead filled with joy and repentance. And we learn to repent along the way. No longer filled with greed, instead filled with cheer as you give. No longer filled with lust, instead filled with God's way to love. Right? Right? What a contrast between all of these. No longer filled with self-pity. Oh, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And you can't change my mind. I'm a victim. In fact, you played a role in me being a victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. No, you are not. You have the opportunity and you have the choice not to be because you're in Christ. In all the power of God. The Bible says this, I'm quoting, the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you, lives in me. So you don't have to be, as you let God's word richly dwell in you, your mind starts to think differently, your attitudes change, your choices change. And when that mindset of self-pity comes along, you reject it. It's a lie. 
I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. I am royalty. I'm a conqueror in Christ. So no longer filled with self-pity, instead filled with confidence as one of God's conquerors. Next slide, no longer filled with selfishness. You can probably get this one with me. Instead filled with selflessness or selfless service, right? No longer filled with emotions. Now listen, nothing wrong with emotions, man. When you manage your emotions uh, accordingly, in God's word, they are powerful to get you from step A to step K, Right? They're powerful, motivating factors and forces in our lives. So emotions are great. It's unmanaged emotions that can do damage. So don't ever think that God wants to rob you of your emotions. That's not at all what God's Word teaches. He wants you to grow and mature so you can manage those emotions so those emotions don't damage relationships as you continue to grow. All right, so no longer fill with emotions. It said fill with God's wisdom to have wisdom day in and day out it's a pattern of growth no longer filled with low self esteem instead filled with humility as a son or daughter of God no longer filled with anxiety and this may be a lot of people here instead filled with the trusting the ability to trust in God you know it's okay not to be able to see what's coming and 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 think you're a little bit anxious and stuff but 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 the person filled with the spirit still may not see what's coming but they're learning how to trust in God. And the anxiety begins to subside and the trust rises and increases because of the power of the Spirit in your life. No longer filled with guilt. There's no reason for a believer in Christ to ever experience guilt. Let me say it again. There's no reason for you ever to experience guilt. And, 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 if, and if guilt taps you on the shoulder, just say, hey, get, up, get away from here. Jesus died for that. He rose for that. Get away from me. Okay? You have to fix your heart and fix your mind. This is part of learning to be filled with the Spirit. No longer filled with doubt, instead filled with faith. No longer filled with disbelief. You all can get this one right. Instead filled with what? Belief, right? No longer filled with hesitation. Instead filled with patience. We don't want to hesitate. We want to be confident, but we want to wait for that confidence to come so we know we're walking where God wants us to walk, doing what God wants us to do. So we wait patiently, right? No longer filled with blame, instead filled with purity. This is all what the Spirit being filled with the Spirit brings into your life over time. No longer filled with half truths, instead filled with honesty. No longer filled with shame, instead filled with honor honor no longer filled with fear instead filled with courage and all of us need all the courage we can muster in these evil days ahead no longer filled with coveting instead filled with contentedness no longer filled with passivity instead filled with spirit led initiative no longer filled with foolishness instead filled with wisdom no longer filled with ungratefulness instead filled with gratitude and there's so much more. But I want, to, I want to make sure concretely that you understand what life in the Spirit brings as contrasted with life not in the Spirit. You don't want to be filled with all the other stuff. Instead, you want to be filled with the stuff on the second slide. Amen? Amen? And when you begin doing that, that's living in the Spirit, then your relationships take on a whole new level whole new level so let me ask you this question as we begin to wrap up here what are you filled with today what is it that you're filled with today let me ask you this way what, what is it that you've been filled with most of your life what do you think about most maybe that's the way I should explain this what is it that you think about most that you dwell on in your heart and your mind most because what, whatever you think about most whatever you dwell on the most that's what's filling you that's what fills you. Now let me ask you this way. What do you want to be filled with? Do you want to be filled with jealousy and anger and self-pity and all these things? Is that, is that what you desire? Or do you desire to be filled with God's Spirit? Amen? Yeah. It begins with the desire, right? 
So here are some of the evidences that flow out of you. We're going to go back to the main text and wrap this up. Verse 19. When you're be being kept filled with the Spirit, you begin speaking to one another differently in psalms. In other words, in other words, it's not that you're quoting scripture, but, but you, you have been dwelling richly in God's words, dwelling richly in you so much that when you talk, the truths of God start to come out. It's what becomes your conversation. Not that you're constantly talking about God, but that he's in his thoughts, his mind, his take on the matter is throughout every conversation you have. Because God's word is richly dwelling in you and then God's spirit has the power to bring it out of you and sustain that. So speak to one another with psalms. That's an indication of God's word. Hymns and spiritual songs. That doesn't mean you gotta go around singing all the time, but you have a song in your heart. Amen? Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things that are evidences of, of you when you're being kept filled with the spirit. Now, last one, verse 21. Uh oh. Uh oh. He's going there. I sure am. Because we've got to dispel some myths this morning. A true evidence of someone who's walking in the Spirit of God, being filled with the Spirit of God, means that they are submitting to one another out of reverence for God. Reverence. To revere. To revere means to deeply respect. It means to greatly admire God deeply respect stand in awe of his incomprehensibility I mean I can't even take in enough of him right you know, enough for salvation and living in the spirit but he is so beyond all of us submit to one another fear, fear and reverence for Christ to revere means you feel deep respect great admiration you may want to write this down. Submission to one another is the bedrock upon which friendships are forged. It's the bedrock upon which lasting friendships are forged. See, your friend circles are circles in which you practice submitting to one another so that when God brings the person to you, younger people, right, with which you may wind up entering into covenant, holy matrimony with marriage covenant with, you, you, you can then mutually submit to one another in marriage out of reverence for Christ because you've learned how to submit to one another as friends at your workplace, at your school, in your family. Amen? And so let me break open a myth here. Myth. Husbands. Husbands. Now we're going to go into a little bit of marriage here. Husbands are not to submit to their wives husbands are not to submit to their wives in fact they're the boss of their home they're the boss of their house men you're the boss now, wait a second verse 21 says submitting to one another out of reverence for God we're going to unpack the rest of chapter 5 and then chapter 6 in the next two weeks in the whole context of everything we're to unpack, all is being wise in how you live. Don't live as a fool, live wise. And to do that, you have to understand what God's will is. And God's will is that each of us as Christ followers are filled, be being kept filled with God's Spirit so we can have this life that we've described. Not filled with all the other stuff, but filled with the stuff that strengthens and makes relationships lasting and substantial abundant myth, it's a myth it's a myth, husbands are not to submit no, husbands you're to submit to your wife God's truth says friends have to learn how to mutually submit to one another and husbands and wives have to learn how to mutually submit to one another and it's in that context that the rest is written and we cannot forget that we're going to talk about a man's sacrificial authority. You've probably never heard those two words together in your entire life. Men, you have authority. You have headship. God's given it to you. But it is a sacrificial authority in headship. 
And the word authority doesn't get used in that context with that meaning. But in Ephesians chapter 5, it sure does. In fact, if you study the life of Christ, the overwhelming measure when he talks about authority is a kind of sacrificial authority. Amen? I'm excited to unpack that next week. And so mutual submission of reverence for God, this is the bedrock upon not only what friendships are forged, but it's also where awesome marriages are forged. Awesome marriages. Let's go back to our main text and wrap up, okay? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The filling of God's Spirit brings with it the power to change the way you think. And therefore, it changes that which comes out of your mouth. When you're filled with God's Spirit, your language changes. When you're filled with God's Spirit, it changes not only how you see life, but how you live life, and also how you talk about life. You being kept filled with the Spirit will change every relationship you have or ever will have. Mm. Regularly dwelling richly in God's Word, letting it fill you up, having the Word within you richly in your heart and your mind, God's thinking, God's thoughts. And you couple that with being kept filled with God's Spirit, empowering those new thoughts, empowering those new attitudes, sustaining your ability to become a, a, live a new way, new thoughts coming out, new words coming out, new attitudes come out, all empowered by God's Spirit. This is being filled with the Spirit. Let's all stand as we close. We have a little extra time planted that way so we can have a time of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed of the prayer. The counselors will come forward, please. Nobody moving around other than prayer counselors, please. Wow, being kept, being filled. Be being kept filled with the Holy Spirit. As we enter into a time of prayer, I'd ask you just to take this opportunity to humble yourself before the Lord and ask Him, to fill you with the Spirit. Oh God, would you fill me with your Spirit again today? Help my anxious thoughts, God. Fill me with your Spirit. Help, help me not to get angry. Fill me with your Spirit. I don't want to be filled with those other things, God. I want to be filled with your mind and your Spirit, your thoughts and your attitudes, your way of doing things by the power of your Spirit through me. May it be so, Lord. Along with asking God to fill you with His Spirit, know that He also wants to fill you with His Word, so you may want to ask Him or make a fresh commitment to Him that, God, I'm going to study Your Word. I'm going to get into Your Word and learn it. I may miss a day. I'm going to pick up the next day. If I miss two days, I'll pick up the third day. But it's going to become a habit in my life so, so that it can dwell in me richly so I can trade out my old thoughts for new thoughts I can trade out my old speech for a new way of speaking new words for, for grace to all new attitudes a, a new way of living and Lord God lastly for some here this, this may be the first time you've ever been introduced to the, to the Jesus of the Bible I want you to know please know this that he loves you and he wants to walk through life with you in the mountaintops and the plateaus and the valleys he will never leave you he will never forsake you when no one else is there and you feel all alone the Holy Spirit is there with you God's with you and for those of you that want to know more about Jesus I just ask that you come down and tap one of these prayer counselors on the shoulder and say, man, would you tell me more about Jesus? It would be the thrill of their life to do so. Amen? Now, God, as we worship you, this last song, God, I pray that you would fill your people with your spirit, teaching them to walk with your spirit throughout their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.